did send out an email that I hope everyone got. If you haven't, make sure you check it. Uh, just about some revisions and the syllabus or changes in when guest speakers are available or not. Um, we're going to Skype um, a session with Marion Goldberg. She's the one that's an on the child special needs. She works in insurance and she's an SLP. She's worked um, with NEC for a long time. Every time we get something scheduled, something comes up. The most recent, though, the good thing is that. Um, They've been on a waiting list for an appointment for ophthalmology for their son for over a year. And the opening came up, and God only knows when the next opening might come up if they don't take it. So, unfortunately, we had to move it to back another week. But that's okay. We will make sure it gets here. Um, and actually, haven't had the information that we're going to cover this week will probably be helpful. Um, Anyway, one, before we get into it, and these slides are um, in the resources, conveniently under the AC assessment process, I think is what it's called, um, so if you need to consult with them. Um, but what do you, before we even get into the logistics and the specifics, what do you anticipate or what can you envision as being a challenge? In terms of assessing, bless you, by the way, for a moment. Um, uh, what what are some of the challenges that we might be faced with in terms of assessment of um, folks who may be taking their feelings for a certain time? I think there are going to be some that should be reviewed. Anybody? Anybody want to take that one? Right? So, how do you assess expressive language in a nonverbal client? For that matter, how do you assess receptive language? And one of the major factors that needs to be considered is a term that was on your their language function is like. That's going to play a significant role in how, you know, what type of system we choose for them. What are some of the other uh, logistical or technical nightmares that you might envision? Absolutely, depending on their diagnosis, they may have behavioral issues. Who here has had the joy or pleasure of participating in uh, the assessment of a child with autism? I'm in a straight jacket sometimes. Seriously, I, I mean, I'm not saying that to be mean, and of course I would never do that, but it's just like, hug them, give them deep pressure, hold them in place, another one to keep their head back from biting the person who's gotten in a bear hug, and another person to take notes on what's going on. Um, it can be a challenge. Behaviors can definitely be an issue. On the flip side, you might have a patient with cerebral palsy. So the issue's not behavioral, it's motor. So my point is that there are some things that are universal to all assessments, regardless. Um, but with the, you know, for example, I'm not going to impair Melissa's confidence, but there are special challenges when we're dealing with folks who um, may be appropriate candidates for ADC. <coughs> and so we have to figure out how to address that.
past semester. We had a, a client who sees Dr. Scarborough um, for a few weeks in his following issues primarily, but um, she also has significant um, communication issues and that kind of thing with her. And um, so Tom requested one of the PC assessments because they had had one previously. Um, it wasn't at the Colonial Center. I'm not really, I don't really recall. Might have been the Missoula. But they recommended this really expensive, really bulky um, OAC device for her. And she's totally not interested in it. And if there's anything she would use it. So many kids, um, and she's not on the spectrum. She is autistic, and she has an undetermined genetic mutation or syndrome of some sort. Um, but uh, she loves mom smartphone. She loves her dad's iPad, and so. First, they were saying that they wouldn't really consider that. Then they were saying, yes, I know the paperwork and the justification, which we've done. And now they're saying, I don't really think any paperwork at this point is very wise. Um, and I really think that the waiver site is clear on that. And that was the point. And that's one thing I would tell you if you take this thing. Um, typically, when sucked into, um, so save everything, um, and you know, it's just a case, particularly if you're going to be looking at a patent-based um, system, a lot of insurance is much tougher, but you know, you're going to be walking into a brick wall. And we're dealing with a VA manager, so um, which I'm not the most familiar with. So before we even start, um, obviously with who are potentially candidates for AAC, we've talked about their complexity, medical, linguistic, behavioral, and otherwise. So we really need a team of individuals uh, involved in the assessment process. And so I put a few of the players up here, or actually pretty exhaustive list of the players up here. But there are some that obviously really make sense. Uh, the SLP, uh, I'm sure you can fully appreciate uh, their role. Um, I think probably, and if we're dealing with a child, a school-aged child, I think it's um, pretty uh, apparent, pretty obvious why we would want um, the special ed teacher, the classroom teacher, uh, the school district involved. Um, but some things that you may not have considered. Do we have to have a medical doctor or other um, prescribing healthcare practitioner involved. Um, PAs or nurse practitioners can prescribe in some states and some jurisdictions, so it may be them, but more often than not, it's going to be a physician. And the reason that we need them involved is because even though um, as speech pathologists we're independent practitioners and do not need a physician's prescription for our assessment, for our treatment, we are going to possibly be ordering durable medical equipment, and that does require a physician's prescription. So we have to have a physician or equivalent healthcare provider involved in order to do the prescribing to justify the medical necessity. So that's why they're involved. OTs. OTs are absolutely essential. Um, in many cases, because we may be dealing with individuals who have issues with tone, issues with uh, trunk control, head control, limb control, 
uh, fine motor issues. And so they are really going to be um, helping us figure out uh, what type of access is most efficient, um, most reliable, um, even plausible. Uh, typically, even your most involved and notoriously some method of access. Same thing as said, you know, every little prod of the hand says that we definitely need those people that PTs may be involved. Um, it's less it's less often that they're gonna have you know any kind of a direct impact on our assessment process, but they may they may be involved with the person's care and they may have um, some input. They're more concerned with mobility and voice motor control. The OT is really more concerned with fine motor and um, vascular transportation. And that's what we're looking at. Um, psychology uh, is often involved. They can be of great benefit in helping us to determine cognitive um, function. Just because a person is nonverbal does not mean that we cannot assess their cognitive skills. There's actually a really cool test that I've given a number of times because it is one that speech pathologists are allowed to give based on credentials. It's called the TONI, the T-O-N-I, the Test of Nonverbal Intelligence. Um, it's a pretty cool test. Um, I have a little gal that I most recently had given it to. Um, for a long time, um, I really felt like she had some severe auditory processing issues going on. Possibly even some aphasia. Um, there was a question of some anoxia during the birth process. Um, she was kind of clumsy and couldn't she had really mild CP, was never really officially diagnosed, but I really think that's what was going on. In any case, she really struggled communicatively uh, for a long time. And <coughs> um, was saying that she was, um, that she had cognitive saying that her IQ is probably somewhere in the range of about 70, leading to 71. I just did not buy it. I, I, just, I felt like that it was an information processing issue, that there were some motor issues going on, and um, mom was really discouraged So we did the test of nonverbal intelligence, and she scored 113. Um, so I said to mom, okay, I don't think she's 73. She's maybe not 113. Let's split the difference. She's probably about 90, 88, 90, somewhere in that range. So she's in the lower end of average, but she's still within the average range. And once we started seeing some accommodations that issue, not a cognitive issue. And unfortunately, as soon as she started showing signs of a communication impairment, people started subtracting IQ points. So um, it's often very, very helpful to have a psychologist involved because they can really help us assess cognition. They can do assessments that look at learning styles, learning preferences, and then obviously if there's any that need to be done for the individual or for the family, they can provide those. Um, social worker. Uh, social workers are often really good sources 
of um, funding information. They may have connections with community resources, um, organizations that may be willing to fundraise or donate. Um, we can help work through um, some of the insurance nightmares that are going on. So if you have the services of a social worker available, that's often very, very helpful. Um, if you have an adult or adolescent um, patient that you're working with or client, uh, having a vocational counselor available um, is often very, very helpful because they can then do a needs assessment, um, they can do a skills assessment. Um, if the person is actually maybe working in a transitional type of uh, work environment, like if you're rural or some sort of a sheltered workshop, they can actually provide information and feedback to help modify or um, in some way alter what we're doing in terms of communication. Um, having someone on your team that uh, is a tech and IT person is not a bad thing to have. We have those resources available. Some of these computers, you've seen some of these devices. Shoot it if it wasn't working. Um, I don't know, so I'm not sure if it's plugged in, if it's turned on. <laughs> so those, those kind of things. But if it's plugged in and turned on, then I'm still not getting the uh, action or interaction or reaction out of the device that I'm expecting. I'm going to call my IT person. Or they have a, and an engineering. Um, the engineering are really good at helping figure out, uh, particularly biomedical engineering. Um, if you have friends that are still considering career options and don't know what they want to do, biomed engineering is a huge growth field. They will be making three times your salary and you may be going into school after a bachelor's degree or a master's or a doctorate. So it's a really good uh, field to get into. And the paid entry session. That could be your plan B. For any of you here, this is, well, maybe I won't get into grad school, so I'll get a master's in biomedical engineering. Nothing else. You won't have to work and buy your way into the grad school market. Um, but anyway, no, the, uh, the, the folks in uh, engineering, biomedical engineering in particular, um, can come up with really cool stuff in terms of uh, switches, um, switch modifications. So anyway, those are some of the ones that you may not immediately think to do that, um, but that's a lot of information, okay? So once you have your team assembled, depending on your, depending on your setting, like here in Miami, we could get access to all of these, but certainly they weren't actively involved. Like in my most recent assessment, um, there really wasn't a need. We already had input from the school, what they wanted. We already had information from psychology about her um, cognitive function. Um, we already had information about her gross and fine motor skills, and she's already receiving OT services at school. So we already had those players available if we needed them. Um, so our goal was primarily just to assess communication and figure out what type of Um, when it comes to your assessment, there are three broad approaches for perspectives or theories, if you want, or models of assessment. Um, some are more favored than others. Um, everyone has their bias. Um, the first and probably the oldest is what's called the candidacy model. And that is where you basically assess the, the individual and then try and figure out, are they a good or a bad candidate for ABC? And if they're a good candidate for what type, are they gonna go high tech, low tech, aided, unaided? It's really focused on eligibility. 
are they a good candidate? And unfortunately for those who tend to be uh, proponents of this model, there's absolutely zero evidence in the research literature that this is the way to go. That's the way I learned. system was very different then. It was very much eligibility based. You had to figure out what was the state, because most of the times it was Medicaid or Medicare, you had to figure out what are they going to pay for. And so you had to, to try and fit your assessment into the eligibility mode. Unfortunately, a lot of people will never accept that reality. <laughs> totally fine. And there are still a lot of people are proponents of the candidacy model. And I'm not saying that that's bad, but it is one of those things that we just don't have any clear evidence from the research that that's really the best approach to take. Sometimes you have no choice. Um, I know in my scenario tells us differently that things have changed. System, it's still very much a candidacy based assessment. Everything is based on eligibility. And until that system changes, you pretty much have to play by their rules. Because that's one of the things that you learn when you get out of school and you start seeing patients is you have to know what the rules of the game that you're playing and you can do what you can to try and educate. From the candidacy model, we kind of segue into what's known as the clinical patient needs model. And so what this did was looked at what are the skills, the strengths and weaknesses of the person's linguistic competency, cognitive and motor skills. And then what are their needs? What type of communication are they needing? Are they like our college student who needed a device to communicate for her, but also for, for word processing, for writing papers, making presentations, things like that? Or are we dealing with you know, a small child who basically needs to be able to indicate basic wants and needs and answer some of the questions? Very different. And we have to balance that with available resources. So what do they need, and then what are the resources? And those resources are not simply financial. Those are cognitive, motoric, behavioral, all those other things. So we have to look at the pros and cons, um, the strengths and weaknesses, and then make your determination based on that. So that your AAC system is truly customized to meet the makes a little bit more sense. You may still have to play some of the eligibility game um, because it may be that you've done this really nice um, needs-based assessment and you figured out exactly what the patient needs, but then you find out that their funding provider will only pay for X, Y, or Z. So then you have to figure out, okay, how do I make what they need to meet these restrictions? We, we face this a lot with, um, with folks who are needing other types of assistive technology. Um, I know in audiology, we deal with folks with hearing aids and assistive technology all the time. They may know exactly what the patient needs um, based on their lifestyle, but they tell us that they have a budget of you know, 
$1,000, we're going to have a really hard time necessarily finding them technology to meet all of those needs if it's a project. So it can be a real catch-22. It's a great question. Um, the most highly evolved model of assessment is what is called the participation model. Um, I hesitate to say that it's the contemporary model the most recent, but I don't know that it's necessarily been embraced any more than either of the other two. I would say, from my own personal experience, this is not based on anything scientific other than my familiarity with some of the folks in the community that are doing assessments, but it's probably three-thirds to a one-third split for each of its models. Um, but the participation model is the most recent, and it's very similar to um, the, the, the communication needs model um, in that you, know, you try and identify their communication needs, but there's a lot more emphasis placed on being proactive and kind of forward thinking. Um, a lot of times, assessments and they kind of get caught up in the what's the person able to do right here right now and they don't necessarily think about the long term does this person have a degenerative condition where they're going to see a loss of cognitive function a loss of mobility a loss of close or fine motor skills um, so the, the participation model kind of takes a little bit from the other two, but then really looks at um, functionality. Uh, you may do your assessment over a series of visits uh, in the home, in the workplace, in the school, whatever the case may be, and then you try and into the, the person's natural environment to see how they behave. Whereas the other two can be done strictly in a clinic with a caregiver or a significant other providing care for them. Whereas the participation model is really getting everyone involved, including the clinician, and it's more focused in on If we're going to do um, any kind of assessment, we have to think of it as a three-part process. Um, the first phase is your actual assessment, um, your history, your uh, looking at their communication needs, their language skills, their motor skills. Cognition. So it's that kind of first full blown assessment that you do with them. Um, it should be ongoing. You should be reassessing, revisiting this on a periodic basis. Um, I don't think we may remember Tana mentioning how there was a lot of trial and error for a while when she was at the Film Center trying to figure out what was going to be the best approach. Um, they played around with um, some third type of um, access for a while, and eventually you know, determined that the, uh, the head dot system was probably best. Um, phase two can occur either in conjunction with that initial evaluation and in my opinion it should. Um, 
before it might come into play somewhere down the road, but this is where you want to really look at where are we going from here? What are the, what's the person's lifestyle like? What are their goals? Um, are there specific situations that we need to be concerned about? Um, you know, Lena has pages that are specific to um, different communication contexts, different communication partners. Um, and they were frustrated, she was frustrated, you know, when her new friend at school needed something and no one noticed and she was frustrated because she didn't have a way to say, hey, my friend needs this. And that's where I think um, this future-oriented assessment um, could really play a role. Getting to make um, accommodations for adaptations that will allow us to expand um, their communication horizons down the road. And then um, phase three is the follow-up, and that's when we may actually bring them back just to reassess the whole system and figure out how things are going. So I don't want you to feel like this first you do this, then you do this, then you do this. One and two, in my humble opinion, should happen pretty much simultaneously. And then number three is you come back from time to time to check on the progress and make sure you don't miss anything. Sort of how we do with an audiology with our patients who have hearing loss. This initial assessment of their lifestyle and their needs. We try and figure out what type of technology is going to work best for them. We set them up with it. We turn them loose, and then we bring them back periodically to check and see how things are going. Okay. All right. One of the things um, that the participation model has. This is where we look at um, in the natural environment, we try to consider all of the factors that are going to um, play a role in our decision making. So the first thing we want to do is assess how independent they are. And there are some pretty standard uh, assessments in rehab, particularly that look at um, a person's uh, level of independence. So if a person is independent, completely independent, they don't need any help for physically setting things up, they don't need someone to supervise and offer assistance or cueing, that's independent. So basically, you guys, um, and, and the things that you do. Setup would be that the person is independent after someone has maybe placed the device in front of them and maybe turn it on. Um, Leanna is probably a setup type of uh, participation where she needs someone to set things up for her, but then she can use it and be independent with it after it's been set up. Um, some people may need verbal cues. Some people may actually need physical assistance. And so they rate how much physical assistance the person needs on a mild, uh, on a minimum to maximum level. So if they need minimal physical assistance, um, it may be that they, you know, they need you to kind of guide their hand and guide their head, um, as it were, but they're really not, you're not having to bear much weight. They're pretty much bearing all the weight themselves, as opposed to someone who's maximum bearing most of the physical burden and they're barely um, bearing any. So anyway, that's how we determine their level of independence. Does that make sense? I would have a few kids playing with it. My wife is just explaining it. Um, okay, 
next thing that you want to do as part of this participation inventory is you want to identify what are the barriers, what are the things that could prevent this person from being successful. Um, there are policy barriers. This may be uh, insurance regulations. This could be um, policies and procedures in the school district. Um, anything that is actually written and says this is the protocol. Then there are practice barriers. These are usually unwritten, often based on misinformation, and a lot of times it's because it's, it's just the way it's always been. Uh, the military system, the VA and the military system, are notorious for having practice barriers. We've always done it this way. This works for us. We're not going to change it. We've always dealt with this manufacturer. If we're going to get a device, it needs to be through this manufacturer because that works for us. And we don't have to worry about dealing with multiple manufacturers, multiple vendors, if something goes wrong. So we'll, that's not going to work because this is the way we've always done it. You know, type of an attitude. These are more attitudes. And then there are the access barriers, which are the true barriers that we're most concerned with in all of those domains. Communication, cognition, mobility, all of those things. So a really good one to keep in mind is this bottom one. We're not used to necessarily having to think about that. And I will tell you, as we are moving more towards an outcomes-based reimbursement um, system for rehabilitation, there is a huge emphasis on the support system. Um, I did some consulting yesterday, and um, they have recently um, updated changed some of the things that might still be the assessment. Um, I think I alluded to the fact in um, person that um, one of the things that suddenly started showing up on our assessment um, screen populates the different sections that we have out um, about a year ago was a not only a reason for so why are you seeing this patient and justify why you're involved? But then there was a section where we had to um, say what would, what would happen if you weren't involved. So what would happen, you know, what's the prognosis and what's going to happen? Justify why we need to be providing services, but then also tell us what could potentially happen if so the person needs uh, the services of a speech pathologist to establish um, a reliable um, alternative or alternative communication system for expressing you know, essential thoughts, ideas, and needs. Okay? Then I have to say, uh, without such services, the patient will be subject to uh, increased uh, dependence and burden of care their caregivers and will be uh, maybe placed at significant safety risk being unable to um, express basic voice needs and ideas. I'm just bringing that up. We actually have to provide a statement now to 
the bill, why we need it, and why we shouldn't deny it. We're getting ready for 2014, which is the implementation of the um, Health Care Act, because we not only have to justify why, why we should be involved, we also have to justify or take away any reason that they should deny it. information about their support system. We have to make a notation of what type of support that they have, what types of community resources are available, from handling or otherwise. Um, we weren't really having to do that, and now it's a required part, so that we have to stay. You know, think about the, the young man in Michigan who had like a round robin of like 25 friends that, that were doing shifts to help him. Um, you know, that's where we would put them. Kind of information that he lives alone, he has um, an aide that comes in. I forget what he said, but there was just a, a short block of time where he had an aide every day. He couldn't get first thing in the morning, and then he had people coming by in shifts throughout the day to cover. It. So we would be putting that type of information in there, and that's one of the things that's now really being scrutinized because um, I think the idea is that setting this person up to be anything less than independent, if there doesn't appear to be adequate resources available, they're not going to approve the services. Does that make sense? So if you're saying, I know I can't get this person to be completely independent, but they're going to be at some level of assistance, and yet their support system isn't in sync with that, then Service. That's a medical decision. They can deny the pain for the service, which for the vast majority of people is the same thing. But um, so just know that you really should consider that support system. Okay? Anything else so far? Okay. So then we're going to do our um, domain assessment. Domains are just the different areas of function that we're going to assess. Uh, the first is position and seating. We don't do that. Who does that? OT does that. Um, the neuromotor function assessment, that's usually a team. Who would be involved in that? OT and speech. It's amazing to me the number of couples that I know where one of the couple is an OT and one is a pathologist. It's like scary how often. I was on a flight from here to Syracuse this summer um, going to a conference and I noticed the guy next Person, because I, I would have, I think I would have recognized a local audiologist by something like, you know, maybe he's a student or something like that. Turns out he was going to the same conference, and he's actually uh, the director of clinical services at Boys Town in Omaha. His rights are OT, and maybe so is mine. We got to talk, and it was just ironic that you know, we're stuck on a plane together. It's okay. Audiologists and that we're actually going to the same type institution and conference, and we're both married to OT. That happens a lot. So, anyway, the neuromotor function.
function tests, so it's going to help you determine access. Are you going to use direct selection? Are you going to use some sort of scanning? Um, and then if there are switches that are going to be needed, um, you're going to have to figure out the type um, and where they're going to be located. Uh, do you know how many types of switches there are? there are about a gajillion. Um, truly, there are so many different switches, and I will be the first to admit that that is not my area of expertise. That's why I am more than happy to have the whole team participating and helping and contributing to that. Um, so anyway, then we have to do um, some sort of cognitive assessment. We have to know what level of symbolic understanding they have. So remember that hierarchy that we talked about earlier on in the semester about how you know the real objects are at the low end um, and written words are at the higher end. So we need to know what level of symbolic function do they have and what's their memory like. We've said consistently guys um, alluded to that in many of your responses on the exam, that uh, one of the advantages of a device is a lower cognitive burden, because it taps into recognition memory as opposed to recall. And, and that's very true, but we have to have some idea about Noticed, and I think um, her aide mentioned that Leanna knows where certain things are, and she thinks that she can get really quick because she knows exactly boom, 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 and she's there. And, and that's part of that memory as well. So it's not just can they remember uh, you know, terms or symbols, but also can they remember locations and how quickly. That's one of the ways that, that has been developed to help people um, be more efficient and locate or remember where things are. Do you remember the color coding of different types of vocabulary, like pronouns of purple and things like that? And we'll talk more about that as we progress through. But yeah, that's, that's what we can directly look at. Then we need to look at their language skills. What's their vocabulary like? their morphosyntactic understanding like you know, can they use verb tenses, can they use uh, word endings. And then we need to look at their literacy. And that can range from just sound discrimination, phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, on through reading and spelling. Okay? And then finally, we want to look at their sensory or perceptual skills, so uh, particularly vision and hearing. You remember um, Monica said that you know, one of the things that they found out very quickly with some of the, um, the tablets and some of the computers was that when you turn it on, it beeps, it makes a sound, there's an audible tone, because for some of the programs to load because uh, they were freaking out thinking that it wasn't working, that it wasn't turning on. And so they'd actually press it again and it turns it off. So this way, you know, and, and that's a good thing because a lot of times people can't hear you with these things and they can't hear you. So they need some sort of alert. Does this kind of make sense? Okay, we're going to go through as a team and assess so the domains are position and seating, neuromotor, cognitive language, and sensory perception. So a domain is just an area of function or an area of skill. We've already talked about, I think, who does what. Um, sometimes the roles are very, very clear. Sometimes they're very, very blurred. And we have teams that have worked 
constraints functions, those those lines tend to get blurrier um, because it may be that we got a person scheduled today and suddenly the OT has to deal with an equipment problem with someone else and they're not necessarily going to be able to come and participate. We need to be able to at least kind of problem solve, troubleshoot through, oh, I think we need head, you know, head switch. Typically, those roles are pretty clearly defined in any ideal situation. They are that you have to have that flexibility and ability to kind of cross train and cross um, perform in order to be effective. And one of the goals of the career plan is that patients need to always be engaged full time. So um, we have a term. when you have a patient who's scheduled for, say, three different therapies or two OTs each, and they have a schedule, and OT goes to see a patient to work on their ADLs, and they're, they're sick or they're refusing. So that, when they go and they shark, they steal someone else, who now that screwed your schedule up because OT took my patient theirs wasn't ready, but I was ready, and my patient was ready um, for me, but now they're with someone else. It's called sharking, where you basically steal patients. Um, and so you, you get subtle messages where suddenly um, you know, shark you because they threw up on the table. Um, and someone in full color photocopied several of those. And so you On your desk because you sharp some medication. It's sort of like if you ever watch um, the, uh, the Amazing Race and when they have um, what's it called when they keep avoiding someone who screws someone over. The U-turn. The U-turn. Yes, it's like a U-turn on the Amazing Race. You get sharp. So, but keep that in mind. And like I said, when you're first doing it, you're going to so worried about even doing your part of the eval, there's no way you're going to be worried about uh, anyone else's part. So just be flexible. Um, in terms of your language specific assessment, the traditional tests that you would use. Uh, Norms or criterion reference tools um, have very limited uh, utility. If you're doing a uh, standardized test, what's one of the rules of thumb? Have you guys had diagnostics yet? No. One of the cardinal rules is that you must follow the protocol. Can't deviate from the uh, assessment protocol, or you can't really legitimately get norms. Hmm. You have people who really can't talk about it. You can't point to the picture. So. These tests may not be best. Or we have to go into it knowing that we're going to have to violate the norms. So we're not going to be able to get norms. We're just going to be able to get ideas about how we can approach it. And frankly, at the end of the day, that's OK. Unfortunately, most third party payment sources, insurance companies, things like that, want at least one formal standardized test to have been complete. 
Now we're really in a catch-22 because we have to use at least one of these tests in order to even get consideration for a device or a system of some sort. And yet, the very population that we're dealing with, there aren't standardized tests designed to be used with them. So you do the best you can. Um, criterion reference tests are often better because they're often observational. Um, has anyone ever done or seen the Rossetti? The Rossetti infant toddler scale, where it's basically an observational checklist. You set the kid down, let them play, engage with parents or caregivers or friends, and you just start checking off what they can do and what they can't do. Um, those are a little bit better. Um, some insurance companies are okay with using those. Um, because you can actually say, I used the Rossetti Infant Toddler Language Scale, so it has an official name. Um, they're usually okay with something like that. But criterion reference um, tests are often better because they allow you to observe and match your observations to I would not try to sell it. No, it's a self problem. And my definition is it's a self. And I broke off site a year ago and it's a self too. And how disappointed I was when I had to do it. So there are some um, specific tools that are available to us. Um, if you would like uh, to do um, an assessment that is specific for AAC, um, probably one of the newest is the ACI, which is Achieving Communication Independence. It's put out by Thinking Publications. They make a lot of software. Um, I really like um, a lot of their stuff. I have not used this test, I have to be honest. Um, but I have seen it. You can Google it. Um, but uh, it is nice because it's designed for both um, pediatric and adult populations. And it is designed to be part of a participation model uses natural context, uh, it looks at their communication opportunities and behaviors and the barriers to their communication, so it's, it's just right up the alley of a participation model. Um, one that's quite a bit older is the Interaction Checklist for AAC. It's more um, pragmatic. Um, and functional based, it's from ProEd. ProEd's been around forever, they make lots of good material. Um, they're in San Antonio. They love visitors. If you ever are in San Antonio and you have a couple hours to kill, go to the ProEd um, headquarters. They love to take you on tours and make sure you see stuff, which is really central. I tried to talk my wife into going there rather than the Alamo because I'd already been to the Alamo and I told her she's so excited. Is it not like the biggest disappointment ever? I swear, I, what, I, when you hear the Alamo, what do you think? This grand building, you know, you know made out of you know, mud or whatever, adobe. <laughs> Anyone ever been to Fountain Square, downtown Cincinnati? That's pretty much what it's like to see the Alamo. It's right in the middle of freaking downtown San Antonio, there's a, you know, it's surrounded by skyscrapers and hotels. It's probably not much bigger than this room. It's really small. It is the biggest freaking disappointment ever. <laughs> I swear. We have a saying in our, in our family now, after we both experienced that, when we're all excited, but remember, the Alamo, you want to set yourself up to be to be disappointed. Um, 
So next time she said, we will actually go on a co-ed tour. I had been on that before, and I'd much rather go on a co-ed tour with Danny than go back to the alley. Um, but it is useful for pediatrics and adults, which is good. Any time that you have a choice between a test that's good for peds, a test that's good for adults, or a test that's good for both, always go with the both. Especially if it's your dime, don't pay for it. Um, anyway, so it's a, it's a checklist, so it's a criterion reference, um, that's, which is nice. Um, I, Another one that's been around for a while is the IPCA. Um, you can actually get this online. You have to contact Dr. Sifters. It's okay. Uh, it is specifically designed for peds. Um, and it looks at those pre linguistic skills. So it's really going to give you a good idea of cognitive function and um, their receptive language capabilities. It's designed specifically for use with severe disabilities. I've never used it. Um, I did email it in for a copy of it, and it took about two months to get it back. Um, So it may have migrated to my new one, I have not found. Um, but I do know that at some facilities, this is like their Bible. That's the care, primarily a pediatric center. A lot of places swear by it. The kids play. You'll hear it referred to by it. Um, another fairly recent, years ago, but it's still fairly recent. Um, it's called the Social Networks Communication Inventory. Um, it is good for both kids and adults. And it looks at um, their symbol capabilities and uh, it has assessment of access. It looks at their modes of expression. Can are they verbal at all versus completely nonverbal? What are their strengths and weaknesses? used it um, just because I haven't really done a whole lot of AAC assessments other than for like the one that we have where I'm just kind of a called in player for someone who already has all the other pieces in place. Um, because I don't really need one of those. We've already got all those other questions answered if they came into it. Um, but I heard very positive comments from people who did about it. And again, it's one of those In all honesty, the most common assessment practice is the informal assessment. And that's when um, the party can just basically go at you. That's the rubber. First of all, I know that they mean they think in buddy and large, so I have the opportunity to see this child on a frequent basis. So I heard it kind of Set her down and tie her with some different devices, um, some different programs, and let her go at it, see what she was able to do. We did do a uh, receptive and an expressive vocabulary test because I just really wanted to know. And it was amazing. Mom's mouth kept dropping to her and her and her towards the floor. And she saw, because I had gone into it and I was like, this child is, I think, she's nine, nine or ten. I wasn't giving the test. I had 
students can have certification or bias involved. But um, where you basically do observations and trial and error with the patient based on educated guess and review and based on um, patient and family evaluation. So it's that trial and Thank you. 